any animal that can be used uh, was used when you had to and otters were no exception in fact uh, an otter skin was worth a week's wage to a crafter so otters were certainly hunted and nearly every district had its otter hunter a man who specialized in taking otters as part of his living an otter skin properly processed was a valuable commodity you could get as much for that as you would get for a week's work and uh, a balanced otter and the human being struck a balance whereby the otter was never at any risk of extinction or anything. He's too fly alight for that. And uh, the local crafter, he would have been the first person to draw back. If the otter or the seal was in danger of extinction, he knew where he was well off. And, and otters, at, at, when I was a boy, were still under, living under that sort of pressures. Uh, uh, so uh, they were not, not so easy to see as they are now. Well, now, the, for, since about 1970, 20, 30 years, otters have not been hunted, and they've reacted by becoming much more tolerant of man's behaviour towards them, which is much less aggressive than it used to be. So that it's not it's no uncommon thing to see otters out of doors in broad daylight now, uh, feeding along the shores in the way that they probably always had done before man came on the scene. Um, for, for, for many years, otters almost became nocturnal, as they are in many parts of the south. Shetland otters live blissful lives compared to their cousins further south. Their numbers have risen to more than a thousand over the last decade, and they hunt in broad daylight now. They've become as adaptable as foxes, nosing about in boats and outbuildings on the foreshore. Their improving status is an indication of the congenial landscape produced by crofting. It's a disappearing way of life, but one that made the most of this sour land and produced an intricate environment full of variety and of nooks and hideaways too. Each self-sufficient croft would have its own patch of cultivated land, a peat lot for fuel and pasture for dairy cattle. And to provide feed for the cattle in winter, there'd be an enclosed hay meadow, full of wild flowers and breeding birds. Often the crofts were worked by women, while the men were away on that other Shetland livelihood, harvesting the sea. Gunner signals by hand to the mate of the weaver. Course and speed are constantly altered to match the whale's manoeuvres. For an old and experienced whale knows well the meaning of the throb from the ship's propeller. Balancing himself on the slippery foredeck, the gunner takes aim. The whole vessel shakes with the recoil of the gun. We don't kill them now, but they did in Shetland just as much as in Faro at one time. Uh, again, it, it wasn't down for sport, it was down for it was a commercial whaley. They were killed for, for their oil which was always a very saleable commodity. They still had whaling in Shetland up to following the First World War. But 1925, there was two whaling stations in, two or three whaling stations in Shetland. But a lot of the, uh, the Shetlanders and, and Walsham men went to the whale fishing in the Antarctic in the years following the war. You left here about August, September, October, and then you joined your ships uh, probably in Shields or Leith or wherever, Liverpool or wherever, and you um, sailed for the Antarctic. And you would be away all winter. It would probably be next year in June before you got back here again. Then the, your children, of course, were maybe the most of a year older than when you left them, and they were quite changed. And They'd gone to school and they'd moved up from one year to the next and, and all that sort of thing. But I used to try and, and uh, arrange my leave for every summer so that that would fall in with the school holidays. At that time, I was young, and my parents looked after the craft, my, my mother and father. Um, but a lot of the men, uh, those left behind with the wives and children, they left their wives and children in the craft. But they were usually extended family. They would have other sisters or parents that would help in the system when the, when the husband was away down to women. It left me at home with the children when my husband went away uh, off the sea to the fishing, and it did feel very lonely, uh, very much on your own. But the most important thing that I always hoped for was the weather to stay decent, because bad weather and boats at sea are a very big worry. 
And then you hoped for good catches, because if they didn't get good catches, then it was all lost labor. It was all expense for nothing. So we were always hoping for good weather and good catches. <laughs> Living on a craft 50 years ago, it was, I'd say, much more hard working. For a simple reason, you had to do everything by hand. Some folks would be digging, or as we called it, delling with spades to plant their cabbages, to plant their potatoes, uh, doing all the planting, and then you had to get your hoe out to cultivate it. There was no mechanical sort of devices. There was no tractors. Uh, the plowing was done with horses. Uh, the carting, again, the horses. Uh, all the cultivation, you had the horses. And when the horses couldn't do it, well, it had to be done by hand. Uh, such as hay making, hay forks, hay rakes, and the whole family or the whole neighborhood, everybody out in a fine day working. I don't think that anybody ever looked on crafting as a romantic way of life. It was hard work, but I suppose that outside the craft, it was very romantic. I know that the people today uh, that run a craft and they have other jobs to supplement their income, but they would never dream of living in the town. See, it's the countryside that's romantic. It's the wild flowers and the birds and the bees and the different moods of the sea. The work is not romantic, but where the work is, is romantic. The patchwork of crofting land attracts its own special birds. Wimbles nest on the wet, heathery pastures, and their calls, half Morse code, half horses whinny, are one of the island's unforgettable sounds. Shetland has close on 500 pairs, almost the entire British breeding population. But corncrakes, whose grating calls once echoed through the summer night in every meadow, are vanishing as hay cutting and grazing become more and more divorced from the season's rhythms. As for snowy owls, they're unbiddable. These majestic birds come from the Arctic tundra, where they feed largely on lemmings. It may have been an exceptional breeding season that brought some overspill birds down to Shetland, where they bred on the island of Fetla between 1967 and 1975. One bird more than any other echoes the pattern of the Shetlanders' lives. The red-throated diver, who nests on land amongst the boggy pools and commutes miles each day to fish offshore. This weaving together of land and sea runs through the lives of everything here on Shetland. Men plough to the edge of the high tide line to plant potatoes that will be mulched with seaweed. Pack horses carry crops and wool from sheep that will have grazed on both the shore and the high moorlands. Sea and land are the warp and weft of Shetland life. And they say that if an Orcadian is a farmer with a boat, a Shetlander is a fisherman with a croft. <laughs> 